Now, we're going to start with a warm-up question. Uh, each question is, diff is different for each one of you. Rob, I'm going to go to you first. We're going to keep it to just 30 seconds. You have the least political experience of the four. What do you think you could bring to London? I'm used to f facing really difficult problems. I started my career saving elephants in Africa, and I've launched a campaign to take on Vladimir Putin in Russia against Russian censorship. I've well, this man is a fucking charisma vacuum, isn't he? Average Lib Dem, I will do good things and not the bad things. I can solve the big problems for London. I think it's probably the first time that saving elephants in Africa has been compared to <laughs> being London mayor. Uh, now, Sadiq, um, you may well... I don't know, suffer from voter... Honestly, honestly, mate, honestly, honestly. I reckon if Nico Amalana run again, if Nico Amalana run again, he would be Rob Blackie. This man is a complete non-entity. Apathy, because you've been in the job for, for eight years. Do you think Londoners deserve a refresh, a refresh at the top? I think this election is a close uh, two-horse race between me and the Tory cadre, and the uh, choice couldn't be more stark. A vote for me it is a vote for free school meals for our children. A vote for me is for affordable transport, for extra police and extra youth clubs, for more council homes, but also as somebody who unites our communities and stands up for our diversity. If you believe in a fairer, greener London, mm -hmm. vote for me on May the 2nd. OK, to you, Susan. Um, Sadiq has previously accused you of running a Trumpian-like disinformation campaign. And actually, this morning, Labour seems to say that they want you prosecuted over some of the um, parts of your campaign, in sp uh, specifically a leaflet which went through um, some voters' doors. What would be your response to that? Well, let's look at it. This is pay per mile. Sadiq Khan says he's not going to bring in pay per mile. But Sadiq Khan also said he would never bring in the ULES expansion. And look what happened there. And that has caused so much hardship for families that simply cannot afford to replace their cars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He, it, was, it was Sadiq Khan who brought in the ULES expansion. Do you want to expand on the reasons why he was forced to by the DFT when Grant Shapps explicitly in his position as head of the DFT made... TfL funding contingent on ULES expansion. Do you want to talk about that, Susan? Do you, want, do, you want, do you want to mention that at all? They think that is bad enough. If we bring in pay per mile or if Sadiq Khan brings in pay per mile, everybody will be paying. And if you look at the evidence, it's in his book, page 186, I'm reliably informed. He talks I'm, about it. I'm going, so I'm it going is to not nonsense. To he will bring I'm it in. I'm going to wrap you now, He will Susan. bring it You've in. had your 30 seconds. Um, and I know it's interesting as well that at no point did Susan Hall say anything positive that she would do. We will have a chance to talk about Luke years later on in this programme. Now, Zoe, there is no second vote. Uh, because voting rules have changed. Do you think that will help or hinder the Greens? I think that people need to vote for what they believe in in this election. The Greens have stood on a really strong platform. of We've been talking about affordability, of workers' rights, of the rights of renters. And if that's what people believe in, that's what they need to vote for this election and vote Green. Oh, you came under, Zoe. I'm very impressed. <laughs> uh, now, we're going to move on to transport and a reminder to viewers that throughout this programme, uh, the results of our opinion poll will be popping up on the screen. So you'll be able to have a look at those whilst we also listen to the candidates. Sadiq, I'm going to go to you first. Um, you, Les, one could argue is your flagship. Um, 45,000 non-compliant cars in London out of two and a half million cars on the roads, raised about 107 million um, and a reduction, a huge reduction of people living in areas with illegal levels of nitrogen dioxide. Earlier, uh, Susan said that your next plan is pay per mile. Is that true? It's, it is uh, untrue. Uh, what I'm passionate about is continuing to improve public transport in London. London has benefited with a first freeze in five of the last eight years, the Hopper Fair, unlimited bus travel for an hour and also with the tram, the cheapest bus fares in the uh, country. What I want to do if I'm re-elected is to make sure all our buses are zero emission. We already have the largest electric bus mm -hmm. fleet in Europe. Just imagine if all 9,000 were electric, but more still trees, got, more rewilding. But we've going out on strike though. I mean, how are you planning on dealing with those sorts of issues? I mean, Sadiq Khan literally just gave them a pay rise. It's weird how just Sadiq Khan was in control of the London transport and just gave the workers the pay rise and then they stopped striking. Really weird. Like, if you get a negotiated settlement with striking workers, with their union, based upon a mutually agreed bargaining process, stop striking. It's crazy, isn't it? Crazy. Mad shit. She's got some unhappy transport workers. Well, we are... Uh by the pandemic had reduced strikes in London by more than 70%. The only people unhappy 
when I worked with the trade unions to call off the strikes uh, this January and last month with the Conservatives. It's really important to talk to our trade unions. They work incredibly hard. I've got a huge amount of respect for our transport workers. Mm. I'm going to carry on talking to resolve these issues amicably rather than sort of strikes we see across the country yeah. with junior doctors and with teachers and with uh, workers across the country. Yeah, but perhaps a bit more urgency with talkers, one, uh, talking to those workers, one would argue. Now, um, Susan, you, Les, seems to be your number one priority, but actually, when we did our opinion poll, 6% of voters polled, just 6% said it was actually their number one priority, but it is such a key part of your campaign. So in that, in that vein, are you still planning on reversing it on day one? Absolutely. Day one, it goes, as does paper mile. And there it's is all... no paper mile, so you can't reverse uh, paper mile if it doesn't exist. No, but you can stop the plans, you can stop all the work going on. Sadiq Khan has already spent £21 million on paper mile. He said he would never bring in the ULES but expansion, specific, and he but did. Specifically, let's talk about ULES. Yeah. Because Again, we have... no point in she said anything that she would do. No positive messages coming from Susan Hall at all. So many compliant cars in London now. What would you say to those families who have forked out for cars that actually if you're reversing you, Les, will be pointless? Well, those families also know other people that simply cannot afford to replace their cars. Um, ULES was brought in on the pretense it would clean up air. Sadiq Khan knows his own impact assessment said that it would make virtually no difference to air quality whatsoever. But what it has made a difference to are those poor families that simply cannot afford to replace their cars. And The studies do show that it does help air quality. I think there are reasonable criticisms that you can make of the impact on poor people who can't afford to upgrade their cars, or indeed people in the trades who need to be able to use vans and things like that for work, for example, that might not be ULS compliant. And we need to have a better conversation on how we make the system effective, cost effective, and also socially just. I would take those criticisms on board. But to say that it doesn't reduce emissions is just not true. And other families have had to take on massive loans to replace the cars. But those it loans will, will still need repaying if you reverse the decision. And I think that that is the issue I think quite a few people are worried about. And as I said, just 6% is their, their main priority. But Zoe, if I'm going to talk about transport for you, uh, you said you want single fare across all transport. I mean, that's not cheap. So how are you planning on paying for it? That's an ambition and it's all about fairness. That's what our transport policy is all about. So it's all about bringing down the fares for outer Londoners, people that are paying. Some people have been pushed out into those outer boroughs and then having to travel further into work. So it's all about creating a system that's a lot fairer. Yes, it will be expensive. I'd have to negotiate with the government for that money. So we'd want to start looking at maybe the DLR first, mm. but eventually getting a one fare like we do on the buses. I mean, uh, Sadiq Khan had to negotiate quite hard with the government for anything when it came uh, to dealing with the TfL deficit which is still, still rather high, why do you think you'll be able to negotiate with them any better? So this I, mean, I actually think the current fare freeze is fine. I think that trying to change too much of the current fare plan, other than just like making it entirely kind of free at the point of use, which would take a lot more money, I think is kind of pointless really and truly when there's such a gigantic London budget. And in fact, a big London, London budget surplus, I think it's a £17 million budget surplus for the London Mayor's office at the moment. I think that would be better spent on expanding free school meals to secondary school pupils rather than just primary school pupils than it would be to change slightly the formula, for example, on how fares are calculated. This is all about setting that ambition and having those conversations, putting forward that evidence, showing why it's so important and the, in, the unfairness across the city that I hear from Londoners that it makes them getting to work difficult. You hear that people are walking to work instead of, you know, using the transport. So it's all about putting that case forward, about, you know, addressing that inequality mm. in the city. It's a, it's a lot of money, though, Zoe. It's a lot of money. So if, if Labour do come in and you are still Labour mayor, it's obviously your, your party. But I can't see Rachel Reeves giving you all the money that, that you want if she becomes Chancellor. Well, I think the exciting thing this year, uh, I call it a moment of maximum opportunity, the chance to have a Labour mayor working with a Labour government in the last four weeks. I've been out with the Shadow Prime Minister, the Shadow Chancellor, the Shadow Home Secretary mm -hmm. and the Shadow Energy Secretary, showing what can happen with the yeah. Labour Mayor on the same side as the uh, government. And I'm so excited at that possibility. All right. Well, uh, very quickly to, to, to you, Susan, and then to you, Zoe. Uh, you could...
And it's worth pointing out again, you know, for all of the things that I dislike about the current Labour Party leadership, at least they have said that they will allow more autonomy and power for mayors to be able to do what they want. They just need to ensure that they dump the fiscal rules to be able to give them the day-to-day -day funding that they say they won't give them. So actually, Khan's promises relying on funding from central government is actually going to be a little bit hamstrung. But of course, there is obviously the potential for the fact that to keep Sadiq elected, Labour might pork barrel somewhat when it comes to funding for the London Mayor's Office. Could end up, if you get into power, working with an opposition government. Do you think you'd be able to do that well? Well, I will work with anybody for the sake of Londoners. Uh, we have to remember Sadiq Khan has got a £21 billion budget. He cries poor the whole time. It's a £21 billion budget. A lot of money is wasted in City Hall. He spent £6.3 million just renaming some overground mm -hmm. uh, lines. We must stop the waste. We must yeah. put the money where it's needed. And we need a mayor that will get the basics right. And will you get the basics right if you have to end up working? Again, an entire statement, all of it was just Sadiq Khan bad. Sadiq Khan did these bad things. Again, no discussion of what she would actually do. She has no policies, just opposition. Working with the Labour government, Zoe? I think the policies coming out of a Starmer government are undistinguishable from a Tory government. They've said that they'll stick to the same fiscal rules which will widen the inequalities in our country and be bad for Londoners. I think that shows that this is the right time for a Green Mayor who will stand up for Londoners across the city. All right, Zoe, thanks very much. Right, we're going to move on to crime, which in our poll came up as the second biggest issue affecting Londoners. Um, I'm going to go to you first, uh, Zoe. You have an ambitious target... Yeah, saying London is expensive for the budget, like have you seen the size of the city? Well, exactly, it's always got a £21 billion budget. Yeah, because he has lots of things that need money spent on, because London has a gigantic population. Of zero murders in 10 years, and your focus is on youth crime. Um, why do you think more youth workers is the answer? So our young people need hope, they need investment, they've had a really difficult time with the pandemic and I hear from young people they just want pe things to do and you know the youth centres and the youth services are offering hope, they offer positive peer-to-peer -peer relationships, they offer um, positive role models and it's just where our young people need to be, this is all about taking a public health approach, mm -hmm. investing in our young people. Greens and City Hall have shown the drastic cuts to youth services and got more investment into those services and it's we need to be looking at the causes of crime and giving people hope and positive things, positive activities, yeah. and positive relationships. Again, all of that also... I mean, I fully agree with the kind of premise of what she's saying here. But broadly, what she's trying to say is that we need to sort the underlying causes of crime. Obviously, we can tackle it on the back end if we want to. But unless we properly deal with the material conditions that lead to this happening in the first place, it'll become a cyclical problem. I think the answer was wordy and not really kind of rhetorically sound. We need, we need positive things. I'm like, sure, but I don't think that necessarily fully answers the question in a way that makes people understand what you mean. So you know, crime is a byproduct of poor conditions for people, relative poverty, for example. We need to fix these underlying problems. Of course, we'll need investment in terms of reforming our police to make them fit for purpose right now. But the long term plan is to ensure that all of the underlying effects that cause crime in the first place can be alleviated through social programmes or something less wordy than I said it like that. The only good player tagline is tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime. I, I agree, actually. I think that's right. It involves quite a bit of money, so the finances for that have to come from somewhere. And Rob, you're a vocal victim of crime, and so this is, this is a big issue for you. You say there should be a more focus on serious crime rather than low-level offences. And you say things like you want to double, double the number of sex offenders and rapists caught by the Met. Absolutely. That's according to your own manifesto. So talking of costs... Where's the money coming from? How are you going to well, do that? I'm going to cancel Sadiq Khan's uh, election gimmick of freezing tube fares, something that really helps tourists because it's single fares only. Like most people in London here will come here and then go home. So mm -hmm. they, they won't benefit from this so much. I'm going to use that money to get more police back on the front line. We currently have 6,000 police in London who are stuck in the back office. That's massively more than any other police force. Those are experienced police who can get there solving crimes. And I think that's critical because the proportion of rapists and sex offenders the police are catching has halved under the mayor. I, if I was in his... I mean, first of all, let's talk about austerity cuts because of the Conservative government. And second of all, I don't know why, of all people, you'd want to trust the Metropolitan Police are catching sex offenders, unless you want them to investigate themselves, to arrest each other. I don't think the Metropolitan Police are in the right position to be the ones being tasked with dealing with this kind of problem.
His position, I would be ashamed by it. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely critical. It's the most important thing we need to do. So that begs the question then, Sadiq Khan, are you ashamed? Well, I'm really pleased to work closely with the Greens in uh, City Hall, despite the cuts to the police, to youth clubs, public services, by being tough on crime, uh, invested in record numbers of police, 1,300 police officers, funding 500 PCSOs, by being tough on the complex causes of crime, invested in youth clubs, after school clubs, holidays. We're still We've still not seen our targets for the number of police officers we need in our streets, though. We're, we're, that's still not happening. We've got a lack of officers. Well, so if we're going to go by what Rob says and we have more officers, surely that will solve a lot of the bigger issues that we have. I was really pleased to be with Yvette Cooper last week and she's confirmed if Labour wins the general election uh, and I win on May, we'll have 1,300 additional officers in uh, London, plus hundreds of PCSs well, she said and uh, special... money allows is what she said. Yeah. What's important as well is that, again, we have to remember that this is under the fact that tens of thousands of police officers were taken off the streets by the Conservative government. Like, of course, I have my criticisms of cops, I'm a leftist after all, but you know, even in 2017, Jeremy Corbyn campaigned on the fact that Tory austerity had taken police off the streets. Because people do broadly support police as a, as a solution to crime. That's why I think that tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, is such a kind of strong phrase for Sadiq Khan to be borrowing from the Blair years. Because it allows you to be able to win the votes of people who do want tough on crime policies whilst also acknowledging that that is only necessary because people haven't solved the causes of crime and of course crime is actually still going down in this country it's only really fraud that's increasing well there'll be 13,000 across the country 1300 in uh, London okay also invested in youth clubs it's always spot on crime isn't inevitable it's preventable. By using the public health approach, youth clubs, after school clubs, schemes in the summer holidays, we've managed to reduce the young people injured yeah. with a knife, homicides, gun crime and burglary. The OMS confirmed uh, last uh, year, you're less likely to be a victim of violent crime in London than the rest of the country, but it is still too high. And that's why this year, a Labour mayor working with the Labour government will be the game changer. Yeah, I mean, but... You yeah, I think Sadiq Khan's answer there was a lot more well-rounded than Zoe's was. Although it's clear that they are both on the same page with regards to how we alleviate the underlying causes here. And broadly, this is why they're, you know, if it was ranked choice... My votes would be Zoe first and Sadiq second, but it's first past the post, so unfortunately I am recommending a tactical vote for Zadiq Khan. You know, there is the argument that, that you know, people say that London is out of control and if you're a victim of crime, you just want it to stop. I saw an older lady who was a victim of crime outside Walsley Station this morning and I had to help her because her phone got, got stolen by muggers. I mean, Londoners are dealing with this every day, but is it correct, Susan, to call it London under siege, which is what you've said it you've called it before in terms of crime stats here. You, you do quite like that explosive um, language, I, uh, what, what one would say. There may be a lot of Londoners that don't agree that they're under siege, but you want to return to local policing. We want more bobbies on the beat. So how are you going to recruit them? Because that tends to be the problem. How will you convince people to sign up to the map? Yes, um, police officers need structure and they've moved away from borough-based policing into great big units called BCUs. That doesn't work. We've got to go back to borough-based policing. We've got to, I will uh, pledge to put two new police bases in every single borough, because at the moment, some of the uh, teams that go to work in areas, as an example, where I live in Hatch End, the people that live uh, working a couple of miles away have to get a couple of buses to the area that they police. So I will open two new bases in every single borough so that the police officers can work and be around the community that they're serving. Mm -hmm. That will make people feel safer yeah. and be safer. Again, this well, all first of all, I'm glad that she's actually finally given us a singular policy. Like we are three fifths of the way through this debate, over 60% of the way through the debate. And this is the first actual policy that she said that she has. And in that policy, she's described the idea of there being a police base. Are they local police stations, love? Well, this all, you know, requires uh, money and we haven't had a cost breakdown from you as yet, Susan, because we haven't had your manifesto as yet. But hopefully it will come in the next um, few days. But um, Zoe, um, in terms of, of, of crime and, and, and policing, like you said earlier, you know, it, it, a lot of it comes down to how we deal with, with youth crime. But now we're going to move on to uh, cost of living, which in our, uh, when it came down to our poll, 
it came uh, key. It came key in terms of what it is that people um, see as their biggest issue living in London. Um, and when they decide how to vote, cost of living comes up top. Uh, so, Susan, I'm going to start with you because you say that you want free schools to be means tested, almost going back to an older system of doing it, saying we're paying for millionaires kids to eat for free. So out of interest, how many millionaires kids do you know that are currently eating for free in state schools in London? Well, I'm, it's, the, it's the theory of it. It's not necessarily millionaires, but it's people that can so afford... So it's not true. So it can af no, it, yes, it could easily be true. It, it's people that can afford to feed their children. But if we're going to talk about the cost of living, shall we concentrate on the fact that in the last eight years... No, I'd like to concentrate okay. on things like free school meals, because that's the question. Literally, literally. <laughs> She's like, can you tell me what your policy is on free school meals? I don't want to do that, but... Shall we talk about Sati Khan for the past eight years? She literally cannot get away from just wanting to talk about Sadiq Khan the whole time. It's so fucking funny. Although, to be, I'm going to preempt the answer here with regards to free school meals. You know, it turns out, first of all, rich people pay their taxes too, and therefore can be at least somewhat expectant upon the state to be able to give them something as well. Second of all, universalism is cheaper because you don't have to pay for the means test. Means testing, have a payment system in place. Having to understand our databases of who qualifies and who doesn't, that costs money. You get rid of all of that red tape, which you know the Tories are supposed to hate, right? By not means testing it. And the most important point is, is you remove stigma. You remove the stigma of the people who are seen to be the people who are from the families who get free school meals, for example, by meaning everybody gets it, so there's no dividing line between people. And you also take away the resentment between people who feel they should get something and see people getting it for free. There is no reason for it to be means tested. It absolutely should be universal. So I'm just going to nip that argument in the bud right now to you okay. in terms of why you feel as though um, a system which has uh, lots of children's charities are very against um, rolling back on a universal system. So I'm interested into why you feel that a means tested system is the way to go because it does affect so many young people. Yes, in it does. It, and it's, it, it's, if it's targeted, then you can give people more nutritious meals. I've been knocking on doors now for nearly a year. People are telling me the quality of these meals aren't good and they're sending their kids in with pack lunch. Mm -hmm. We're looking at 140 million pounds. That money could be targeted to the kids that really need that far better than a blanket target for everybody. Well, and so that's what that So that's like less than 1% of the budget going on free school meals for primary school kids. And even then, her answer to this isn't i have a nutritional breakdown of the kind of meals that are being provided it's i've spoke to somebody and they told me they reckon it's unhealthy okay that's lots of evidence isn't it that was my comments on that um i mean zoe you want to extend the free school meals into secondary schools again a lot of money how are you going to afford that one so this is about supporting our families everyone's experienced primary schools closing in their areas and families being priced out of our cities also hang on a minute before we move on before we move on can we talk about zoe garbett's shoes right zoe garbett is wearing the goth boots you know you know right if it wasn't for sadiq khan on first past the post you know we should absolutely be supporting goth boots for mayor Everyone's experienced primary schools closing in their areas and families being priced out of our city. So this is really about the core of who our city's for. So I'd absolutely extend the universal free school meals to secondary school children. I've managed big budgets in the NHS. I've worked in the public sector for over 10 years, managing multi-million pound budgets. And I really, our manifesto is out there. It's totally costed and I'm fully, fully um, aware of where all the money's coming from. And this has to be a priority. OK. Um, now, Rob, also worth noting that it's also economically positive. It has positive effects on the economy by having children better able to be able to continue their education because they're well fed. It makes them more productive later on and also is, is easier for working people who have children not to have to spend time dealing with the lunches for their kids, which makes their ability to engage with society better as well. So there are, there are overall economic benefits for this too. So it's not all cost. There is also actual cost benefit as well. Both um, Sadiq and Zoe are keen to look into things like rent control, despite the, the evidence that shows in cities like Berlin and Scotland and Ireland, for example, it, it can often be detrimental to a city. So how do you propose to deal with London's housing issues? I mean, rent control has worked in other places, like you look at New Jersey, which has had pretty good results with 
things like rent controls. It just depends on making sure that you can engage in an additional supply increase coming from the state. It also, if you look at the evidence provided by Unlearning Economics in his video about Economics 101, talking about, well, actually, a lot of the times rent controls move properties out of the private rented sector into the own occupied sector because landlords find it harder to be able to turn a profit. So it makes it so that we actually have fewer landlords overall. So I disagree broadly with the housing policy coming from the Greens, because they don't have enough of an emphasis on wanting to build enough new council properties rather than just trying to take back other ones using right to buy back. There is also arguments to be made for rent controls alongside an increase in supply by state building for council housing. That's my preferred method. People's cost of living problem is severe in London, particularly because of soaring rents. And that's really, there's a simple reason. Our population has shot up in the last 15 years in London. We haven't built the houses to keep up with that. Sadiq has missed his housing target almost every single year. We need to build a lot more housing to bring rent. The absolute barefaced cheek the temerity of a liberal fucking Democrat trying to impugn literally anybody else for not building enough houses. The absolute cheek. The cheek of a liberal Democrat not building enough houses. Trying to say that other people don't build enough houses when you are a liberal Democrat. Heaven forfend. Rents down. If we're going to do that, we need a London housing company to build housing on behalf of London government. But we also need to get the private sector building more. And that means taking out the red tape that makes it so slow and difficult to build a house in London. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? They're just grifters. They're just grifters who will change their opinions on a dime. Or we're campaigning in a rural constituency, or indeed in the che Cheshire and Amersham by-election that's happened in this electoral cycle, where they campaigned against the Conservatives, specifically because Boris Johnson had plans to liberalise planning laws to get the private sector building. Suddenly, oh, we're in London, we're in, in a city where people want to have more houses. Oh, now we do believe in, in getting rid of red tape to have the private sector building again. Ironically, I agree with his plan for a state-owned London-based house builder to build new council housing. This is a good thing. But as Ben Sharp rightly points out in chat, the place in the country which has the most amount of new council houses being built is literally in London under Sadiq Khan right now, as well as the fact that he's also bringing in council houses from the private market too. Like Sadiq Khan is the person with the best record on house building of anywhere in the country. Okay, to you Sadiq. Um... As Rob has mentioned, we're not meeting the demand on, on affordable homes. Back in March, the Housing Secretary Michael Gove, uh, to quote him, he said, to tackle the housing delivery backlog and meet targets set within the London plan, the average rate of delivery would need to increase from 37,200 to more than 62,300 homes a year. And we're not doing that. We're not doing it. So how long is it that Londoners have to wait before actually they're able to get affordable homes and be able to afford to live in this beautiful city? Well, we've smashed every single government target set since 2016. The most completions in our city any time since the 1930s, the most council homes any time since the 1970s. We're building 10 times the council homes than the previous mayor did. If you look across England, we're building more than double the amount of council homes in London compared to the rest of the country. But what we need is more investment in council homes, more investment in generally affordable homes and not luxury flats for foreigners to use as gold mm. bricks and also we need a way to control the rents in London that's why I, I back rent controls in but London 2.3 million Londoners living in rents well wow. yeah see what I mean Sadiq Khan is, he's got everything he's got everything that I would want to have from a London mayor he literally when I said earlier I disagree necessarily with just rent controls we need expansion of state property and he's just giving us everything like he's based like he's, he's just based like I'm sorry he obviously should be very clearly criticised for his undermining of Jeremy Corbyn throughout the Jeremy Corbyn years, right? But you know me, I don't care about personality, I care about policy. And Sadiq Khan's policy is excellent. I just wish that all of the policies that he do does which are good were echoed by the Labour leadership, which they seem to want to run away from. Rented accommodation. On, I promised six million rent control homes if I win. Forty thousand council but we homes. We can see That's the, the we evidence can make. exists that it doesn't always work for a city. It can decrease the number of homes that are available for people to rent, and also uh, it, people just there will not be enough homes for people to, to deal with. You promised rent London, control. It's also worth pointing out that the evidence, right? So the evidence can show. I think there is reasonable evidence to show that sometimes when you do rent controls, quality of housing goes down because of the market mechanisms not requiring there to be much more investment from landlords to compete. So that's one thing you do get is the quality can go down. And I think that's true. I would seed that information necessarily. Unless, of course, you know, you take more 
of a personal desire to want to improve yourself when you live there. But the idea that necessarily reduces housing supply is only contingent on the state not building more, and there being fewer homes to privately rent also means that there are more own occupiers, therefore meaning the number of people needing to rent goes down. So the supply and the demand for renting goes down as we move people into public renting and also into own occupiers as landlords sell off their properties to people who will buy them to live in them. This is what rent controls do. Again, go watch the Unlearning Economics video on it. A lot of the studies just show, look, the number of rental properties has decreased. I'm like, yeah, because people are just living in them now because they've bought them to live in them. I agree. We need to build more houses. We need to build more council houses. 100% down on that. Sadiq Khan is right. Not luxury flats, proper, affordable council homes. All fantastic. Agree with that too. But that alongside some level of rent control as well is something I absolutely advocate for. Londoners are drowning. In, in the rent they pay and the mortgage they pay. List Trust's budget led to people's mortgages going up by £630 a month. People's rents are going up by 20% yeah. every year. We need more homes supplied to meet yeah, demand course, but and I more protection for renters as well. And I, I get private, those I'm private, so I'm a private renter and I know how insecure it can feel and unaffordable the city is. And this is all about setting up a rent commission so that renters get to decide what the model looks like and get a better deal for renters. They would hear from landlords to make sure that the market isn't going to collapse. But right now it's really not working for the millions of Londoners. You've got, Lond you've got renters who won't even complain to their landlords about a, a simple fix you know like a light needing to be fixed because they're worried about rents going up or being evicted and this is about being on the side of renters okay. uh, Rob, very true oh, what city promised this at the last election i was just watching last night your debates last time you said exactly the same thing three years ago and i think you need to explain why haven't you done it well because we've got a conservative government but the labor the labor party now nationally say that they wouldn't do it either because we've got a conservative government well, where most of the mps uh, in parliament are landlords and they're worried about rent saving more rights. So, but, but your party up. leader says that he wouldn't do it either. No, but I mean, if we're going to go by, by that logic, or if, if Labour are to get in as the next national government, and all of that stuff would be reversed, one would argue. Well, absolutely. Angela Rayner has promised if Labour was in an election, no fault evictions will go. So, the heartbreaking stories Zoe's talking about, where a tenant is scared to raise the issue of damp or mm -hmm. mould because uh, they could be uh, evicted, will not happen if Labour wins the general election. What I can promise Londoners, though, is if I win on May the 2nd, 6,000 rent control homes, we've got the money for that. Mm -hmm. 40,000 new council homes, we have okay. the money of that, and being on the side of renters rather than dodgy landlords. Well, I think there'll be lots... Based, absolutely, absolutely. Why isn't Labour committing to that like the party? What makes him different and able to say something different? Because Sadiq Khan is a representative of just himself. In the same way that Andy Burnham is the same thing. You know, you see Sadiq Khan and Andy Burnham deliberately undermining the Labour leadership on loads of things. Like Andy Burnham has been explicitly pro proportional representation for a very, very long time and said that he is upset that the party won't say. It. In fact, Andy Burnham was when being interviewed by Rivka Brown from Novara Media, specifically said he believed that the Labour government of 97 to 2010 explicitly got it wrong on privatisation, which is a big admission from somebody who was part of that cadre to begin with. You know, he's he's willing to climb down when he thinks that he's wrong. And as Ben Sharp points out in chat, like this kind of rhetoric, this kind of language, this kind of policy is what you would have expected from Keir Starmer based upon his leadership campaign pledges. Yet where are they? Where is it? It's nowhere. I mean, Sadiq Khan was the one who called for a ceasefire. He was the first mainstream Labour politician to call for a ceasefire. He's been doing it for months, months and months and months and months and months. Sadiq has to win just the city of London, which tends to be to the left of the country, I guess. But, you, you know, at the very least, you can take the policies that he's campaigning on and maybe rhetorically like, dress them up differently because they're all excellent policies. Lots of Londoners who are sitting in, in homes right now who aren't up to scratch or wishing they could live in affordable homes that we kind of just want them to be built because, as Rob has mentioned, it's very similar to what you were saying four years ago, Steve. Anyway, we are done. Um, on screen right now is the full list. Well, at least now we know that Sadiq Khan is really good. Zoe Garber, excellent challenger. Rob Blackie, disingenuous, grifting idiot. Susan Hall, IQ. Zero IQ. Fridge temperature IQ. Has no policies other than Sadiq Khan bad. Well, I'm glad now that we have a full idea of who we should or shouldn't be voting for come the election. Hey there, if you enjoyed the video, make sure that you like and leave a comment that helps the video out in the algorithm. If you subscribe and ring the bell, it'll let you know when I go live. I stream every day on YouTube and Twitch. You can also follow all of my socials down in the description. And if you want to support me in a more financial manner, there's a join button for membership to just 99p to be a member on YouTube, as well as a patron. And there's some merch there as well. And hopefully I'll catch you on the next video. Take care.